to that screen. It, it's my pleasure to introduce Stu Solet. And Stu is a um, co-worker of mine. He's been working for ExxonMobil for 28 years. During that uh, career, he's, uh, he's been responsible for the development of a number of different uh, uh, catalysts, most notably uh, uh, the Nebula Catalyst uh, for hydrocarbons. But today he's going to talk about some of the work we are today associated with our development of Fisher Tropes catalyst. And the title of his talk is Reversible and Irreversible Changes in, in Cobalt Fisher Tropes Catalyst During Synthesis. So, Stu, take it away. Well, I'd like to thank Tom and Patrick for the opportunity to present this work today. And Tom mentioned the 28 years. And in some respects, you had to have a long term lifetime in Exxon and Exxon Mobil to have worked on Fisher Tropes because the work is preceded in three discrete quanta, each one taking several years during the different decades. So during the 1980s, we had the first uh, period. Um, during that time, it was everybody at, at Exxon was getting their feet wet in the area. We did a lot with understanding the preparation of the catalyst, the function of biometallics, the role of transport and reaction and the interplay between the two. We understood things such as the fact that the metal uh, activity, um, the site time activity was constant for cobalt crystallites down to about eight nanometers. So that period came and went and, and uh, there was a little bit of a break after that quantum came through. And then the second uh, period came in the mid 1990s. And during that time, a lot of the work was involved in understanding the lifetime of the catalyst. There are issues with the activation with this catalyst, and it was very important because of the cost of the catalyst and the way the process is operated that one can maximize the lifetime of the, of the particular <coughs> catalyst that's being used. And the, so the design of the process and the catalyst itself was a key focus during that time to try to mitigate the deactivation and to learn how to work with it. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. The third quanta that came through a few years ago uh, was more involved in all of the upscale issues, both in terms of the catalyst, the process, the engineering. You can imagine for a plant the size that we're talking about, which is over 100,000 barrels a day, how much engineering work is involved. So that phase came and also passed. So now we're quietly waiting for the fourth quanta to arise. And some of us hope we're there long enough to see it happen so maybe we can finally have a project. So, <laughs> it actually does something. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk to you about the second part of that, and that's how this catalyst changes during its operation on stream. Now you say, well, you know, if you look at the Fisher Tropes catalyst, it's relatively simple. It's a supported metal on, on just a, an innocuous, or we, hopefully, innocuous support. So you say, that's very simple. We all do that. Some of us have done that the first time we ever got into doing catalysis research. So why is it so complicated? Why do we have to work on this so hard? And why, what makes this such a, 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 a difficult problem? And you're going to see it is a very complicated problem. And it requires a lot more than just putting a catalyst together and hoping it comes out right. Some of that comes into the fact that in, in Fisher Tropes, we have several issues. One is that there's a redox component going on here. The hydrogen in CO is reducing. The product water is oxidizing. It, uh, it changes as a function of conversion, the radox potential in the system. The cobalt is a radox, radox active material. Sometimes there are components on the support that are also radox active. Plus, with the water there, you can also get into essentially hydrothermal regimes. And those of you that have worked in catalysts and hydrothermal regimes know that that's also a, a seed of instability. So that's why this is such a, um, you know, actually very complex area and an intriguing one and a critical one to really understand. So with that uh, preamble, let me get into what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to describe a variety of experimental catalysts that contain cobalt on a variety of different oxide supports. Um, I'm not going to tell you about every particular nuance of each support. We just can't go there. But I'm going to show you some things that I hope will get across a message that there is some generalities that can be drawn here on this system that transcend the particular support you're using, but are really critical for most systems. And we're going to see that during long-term studies, some of which I'm going to show here, that there are multiple paths of deactivation. Some of them are reversible, and by that I mean that with hydrogen treatment, you can come back to where you started from. And some are not. 
And you're going to see that the ones that are not are the more critical ones because you just can't get that activity back without doing something really dramatic. And then the ExxonMobil AGC21 process. Now I think it's probably going to have to be the, well, I'm hoping it's not the AGC22 <laughs> process. <laughs> the AGC21 process really took into account, seriously, the things that we learned here about this catalyst and the process to try to mitigate the effects that um, we have and minimize the deactivation. So let's, let's take an overview. Um, what I'm going to exclude from this presentation are heteroatom poisons. That's an issue. If you have sulfur running around your system, you're in deep trouble. So we're not going to get into that. We're going to assume that you get to a clean state. That's very important. But even if you have a clean state, you're going to have issues. The first one that you start off with is the fact that the cobalt, or at least the, the surface of the cobalt particles, can oxidize. Now this has been described many times before. I think Professor Holman's in the audience somewhere. He has done a lot of work on this, Professor Bartholomew. So the, you can get certain fraction of the surface to, to oxidize, but if you treat it with hydrogen, you can generally get that to go back to the metal. So that's our reversible one. That in itself is not that big a problem. It can be worked with. The problem is that when you have this going on, it can lead to more, to two paths that are irreversible. One of them is where you actually make a cobalt support mixed oxide. Once you get there, that becomes now impossible to reduce the temperatures that you're going to be able to subject the catalyst to. And the second one, and this is the one that really I'm going to talk a lot about during the presentation today, is the fact that that, we believe, leads directly to a big issue here, and that's the cobalt can agglomerate during the run, particularly when you start running long term, which is what we need to do. So we're going to look at all three of these. And what I'm going to really try to focus on today is some of the more simple, simple characterization techniques that we used because they were very powerful. We have some more complex ones that we've used. They, they give very confirmatory evidence. But just for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to focus on these. We're going to look at uh, reduction oxi oxidation cycles as a way of quantifying the amount of this mixed metal oxide that's formed. We're going to look at the agglomeration in two ways. One very simple qualitative way is looking at the oxidation kinetics of the cobalt. And I'm going to show you that in a second, as how you can use that in a very simple way to just tell whether your cobalt is wrong. Um, we also use Kenny's option as a way of counting the metal sites. And really what I'm going to focus on today, and a lot of the talk is involved in this, using transmission electron microscopy to really look at the changes in the cobalt, both in their size and the particular mechanism of agglomeration. And for this work, I really have to acknowledge, special acknowledgement to my co-author, Chris Cleaver. As you're going to see, she did a Herculean effort in, in trying to help us understand all of this. OK, so let's start looking at all of these influences. The first one I'm going to look at is the reversible cobalt <laughs> oxidation. This is a, a also, this is going to show you now some TEM micrographs, which show this nicely. So here's a, a catalyst particle. Let me just say that one of the things that Chris did in terms of using the microscope as effectively as she did was if, if, you, if you mount a little bit of the cobalt catalyst on one of these holy carbon grids and you pass synthesis gas over it, you have a couple of milligrams of catalyst there, you don't know really what you have. So what she, real, what she did to, to really make this an interesting study, she constructed a little fixed bed reactor, a very small one, where she could put the carbon, holy carbon grid underneath the bed, at the exit of the bed, and so adjusting how much catalyst she had there and what the flow rate was, knew what the effective conversion would be. So she could run low conversion, high conversion, and then she was able to take the holy carbon grid, transfer it inertly back into her microscope, and get back and look at actually the same area of the catalyst and the same cobalt crystallites that were there before the treatment. She could take it back out and do a further treatment, put it back in, is beautiful. And that, a lot of the, the TEM micrographs I'm going to show you today were done that way. So here's a typical one. Here's, a, here's some cobalt crystallites on the support. This is at point A. So point A is where the catalyst has been run for some time. There's been some deactivation. And we see an area that looks like this. These dark spots over here are the cobalt crystallites. Now what we do is, in between these cycles, we turn off the CO and we just run hydrogen. So this is what we call the rejuvenation. And when you do that, and now you look at the same area, if you look very closely, I'm, I'm hopefully we can see this here, you see a lot of small ones that weren't here in the first one. And the reason they weren't here in the first one is because they had oxidized well, during the course of the reaction. So what comes out very clearly is that the small crystallites are the ones that oxidized first, 
And a lot of this uh, deactivation in these short-term cycles is due to this deactivation caused by the presence of water as the product. Okay, so that's, we go through B, and then we run it longer, it continues to deactivate some more, and you wind up in C. And C now is the same area. Sometimes the, these micrographs get rotated, but it's the same spot. And now the small ones, or a good fraction of the small ones, are gone again. So this is the reversible uh, oxidation that goes on that can be reversed by hydrogen. That in itself, like I said, is not that critical a problem. But let's see what it leads to. And in some cases, so let me just summarize that, that small cobalt particles oxidize first. And the reason, okay, so let me bring this is an important point. The reason that we think that this is, has such a, can have such a deleterious effect, because when the cobalt oxidizes, it tends to interact with the support more strongly, forming either a cobalt oxide, hydroxide, or oxyhydroxide, and spreads, wets the support much better than the metal does. And doing that now, it can create those two problems that we're going to have. One's forming the mixed metal oxide, and the other is the agglomeration. So let's go see more about that. So how to, how to look at the, um, the formation of these irreducible mixed metal oxides. Also, this is relatively simple, okay? You can just do this as long as you have a good high precision TGA where you can run hydrogen, you can run uh, passivation gas, you can run oxidation, and, and uh, the thing can do it sub so sequentially. You can do this. So you take a catalyst that's been running the unit, it's a spent catalyst, you generally will wash it off, do soxyl extraction, get the wax off, take it out. It's in some arbitrary redox state. It was reduced in the unit, it's seen air, partially passivated. You don't know where it is in the scale. In the scale I'm showing here is a fully oxidized cobalt, fully reduced cobalt. So it's somewhere in between. So you reduce that now, and that weight loss you get your reduction is not going to be very meaningful because you don't know where you are here in that catalyst. But what happens is you go through the reduction, two things could happen. All the cobalt there can either go down to cobalt metal, or some of it could get tied up. If you form some cobalt mixed metal oxides, that cobalt is going to be stabilized as cobalt plus two. It's not going to make it all the way to the metal. So what happens now, and where the information starts to come out, is on the subsequent oxidation steps. So if you oxidize back up to 500 degrees, you'll get back up to CO304, except for the stuff that's already locked in is the cobalt plus two. That'll just stay there. So depending on what this weight gain is, it can tell you. Now, you can say, well, maybe during that first step, if there's a little bit of carbon left over because you didn't wash it well or there's some carbon formed on the catalyst, well, this weight loss might be a little bit less because you're going to lose some weight when the, when the carbon burns off. But then you just go through a second cycle. Reduce, and it'll either come down to where you have the mixed metal oxides or it'll come down to cobalt metal. And then you look at the second oxidation step. Now, what we found largely is that O1 and O2, both of these oxidation steps, were usually very, very close to each other within 0.01. Okay, telling us that actually during this, the, the, the soxalate extraction and the subsequent reduction, we were able to get essentially all of the carbon off of the catalyst. Otherwise, this would have been a much smaller number than this one. And if we took that catalyst and we went ahead and retested it, uh, after, or retested it after a 375 reduction, which we find from the subsequent oxidation doesn't have much carbon, or it doesn't have any carbon left on it, but if we just do that reduction and go back and retest it, the activity is still impacted on a deactivated catalyst. It's still very low. So in our hands, and in our belief, the carbon, and I, I know there might be a talk later on this week, and I hate to generalize because every time I've generalized about anything in my life, it's always turned out that there's an exception. But in our hands, in the way we've been running this, we didn't see carbon being a strong deactivating evidence, and that's part of the evidence for it. Okay, so you do this, you compare it against a fresh catalyst, and you can get things like this. So here's a particular experimental catalyst that was run actually for a long time, for several months. And you go ahead and you take it out at different times, and you do that TGA experiment. And you find if you go back and you reduce it at 225C, why? Because that's a temperature you can access uh, in the efficient tropes uh, slurry units. And you, you find that actually after about six months, you can lose up to 10% of your cobalt out of your reaction manifold is a mixed metal oxide. Once that happens, that's gone. It's very hard to get that back without sort of redoing everything in terms of rebuilding the catalyst. If you can go to 375 uh, reduction, well, the loss isn't that bad. That extra 150 degree C gets some of it back. Okay. But that's a, that's a loss. So this can be a loss, not a huge one, but one that you need to be aware of. The more serious losses that you can have come in the agglomeration. And that's what we want to spend a lot of time talking about now. 
So in a very simple way of, of measuring agglomeration, and it was the first way that we had actually seen this, if you just take a reduced cobalt particle on a support, and you go ahead and you just do a programmed oxidation, what happens? You make cobalt oxide. Yes, but you make it that the kinetics of that oxidation are what we're looking at. And why is that? We're going to see in a little bit. Because when the cobalt metal oxidizes, like most metals do, the metal ions, the metal atoms, move from the center of the crystallite towards the outside. And there's a kinetic path that it has to take. And so the particles that are larger take a longer time to oxidize. So you can take a look at the curves of the oxidation and at least get a qualitative idea on whether you have any growth of the particle. So let's, let me show you an example of that. And what I plotted here is just a derivative of the weight gain as a function of the temperature. So here we've taken a catalyst, we've reduced it, we passivate it first because you can't just put air in there, the thing will just catch on fire. So you, you put inert, you passivate, and then you start to oxidize it up to 500 degrees. You don't worry too much about the front end here because this is affected by how much the catalyst passivates, and some of that is a function of how small the crystallites are. But what the, what's important is the back end here, because this is where the larger particles are oxidizing. And so this is what a fresh catalyst can look like. And this is what we got out of that end of run uh, catalyst, uh, similar to the one that I showed you on the last slide. And you can see now that the tail has moved out to significantly higher temperatures. And if you follow this during the course of the run, and, and we'll see when we, we quantify this, and we'll quantify this later on with the PEM, but this definitely reflects a larger particle size. So that was kind of our first indication that this was going on. And what was also very interesting, if you take this at the end of the run, it's oxidized now, you go back, and you basically do the same thing with the same material. Oxidize, you go back, re-reduce it, and re-oxidize it. So basically repeat this step. So reduce it, and then plot the re-oxidation step. You get this blue one. Well, that looks interesting, because now this has moved much further to the left, just a little bit outside where the starting catalyst was. So there's a suggestion there that maybe the particles have gotten smaller when we've reduced them, oxidized them, the green one, and then re-reduced them and re-oxidized them. So that oxidation after the reduction looks like, hmm, might be interesting. Maybe we can make them smaller. So we'll talk about that also. And, and so that was the first piece of evidence. And we continue to, continue to use this all the time uh, as a way of looking at, just qualitatively, in a very quick manner, whether things had grown. But to be more quantitative about it, um, you, you have to do TEM. And a lot of the data that I'm going to show you now were done using transmission electron microscopy. And not only do we look at the size of the crystallites, but one of the key things that came out of this study was the fact that the distribution of the cobalt is absolutely essential to making a good stable catalyst. So here's two catalysts that are very close in composition. They're on the same support. The only thing that's different is that they were made in different ways. And in one way, in the ones that are shown in the blue ones, we had a less clustered distribution. In the one that's in the purple here in the squares, we had a more clustered distribution. We actually had smaller crystals of the one here, the purple than the blue one. And they started to grow very fast, as you can see here. But even when they reached a the comparative size to the blue ones, they continued to grow faster and to a larger size. So when somebody, this is just a caution, when somebody says that they have a, a uh, they, they've run, so let's say this is done on support A, and somebody asks me, okay, here's support B, and what's better? What gives the most stable catalyst, support A or support B? Well, you better be careful when you answer that question, because this is both support A. It depends how you made the catalyst on support A. It depends on the nanoscale homogeneity that you've achieved. And that is a, a key learning. Now, that's not the only time we've seen this influence of clustered versus non-clustered nanoscale homogeneity. And I'm going to go through this quickly on, because this is just another example um, where we've seen the same thing. It's not a fish tropes example, but I just want to show you the same thing. We have a ruthenium catalyst that I've talked about in the past. This, work, this part of the work has been published. Two catalysts on ruthenium on silica make two different ways. Without going into the details, both of them have high dispersions. One of them, the dispersion falls off as you increase the reduction temperature. The other one, actually, has, you can't even measure the dispersion until you get up to high temperature. There's some carbon on this. Okay? So but by the time you look at these, if you look at this one, it, it reduced at 150, and you look at these reduced at 400, they're about the same dispersion, same crystallite size. One seems to be 
unstable, and the other one seems to be stable. And what we learned, again, from doing TEM on that is the one that was not stable, if we look at it at 150, you can see little dots of ruthenium in here, almost like, like little gunshots. We call them graveyards. And when you start to reduce that now, you go from 150 up to 400, you saw that the chemisorption went down. These particles get larger because they're so close to each other. The one that was stable at 400, we have the individual ruthenium crystallites well separated from each other. Okay, so this effect is, is more general than just what we've seen in fish and troughs. And it's a key component in understanding metal catalysts. Very important, I think, in most systems. So let's go back and see now. We know that, that, the, that the spacing and the, the homogeneity is important. And here's maybe another reason why, why that is. The effect of water. We said that water had to do the surface oxidation. It, it can also lead to the other problems the mixed metal oxide and the agglomeration. And here's a direct example of it. Here's two different catalysts where we look at the distribution in size at the inlet versus the e exit. This one there's a little difference. Here there's a much larger difference. In both cases, it's larger at the outlet. At the outlet where the water concentration is higher, we see this over and over again. So particularly when you do this in fixed bed reactions, it depends where you pick the catalyst out from the bed. Higher the water, the larger the growth, the larger the oxidation, the more the spreading on the support, and so on. And actually, even if you take, so here if you have a series of cat, if you have a, a catalyst that's been run for a long time, and you make a plot of what it looks like, you do the same type of run, but now you just partially reduce your, your initial catalyst, so that it's, this is really very poorly reduced, not just missing a little bit, but a lot, and go ahead and measure uh, that, just for a short period of time, you find that those particles are much larger. So. A direct evidence, my opinion, of the influence of water and, and of the oxide that's formed from the water, the hydroxide, in, in forming larger particles. Okay, so then we get on to the point of what, what is the actual mechanism that goes on in, in the growth of cobalt in the Fischer-Tropsch system. So generally there's two mechanisms, at least two, that, the two major ones that you can think of. One where you have coalescence, that is where the particles actually touch each other and grow by kind of a mitosis. Um, and one where oswald ripening, where we have a molecular transport of some of the species on the surface, which in the end gets you, they both in the end get you to the same spot. That is, you both wind up with larger particles. But you can see in the intermediate states, it's very different. Here you have these particles coming together mating with each other and, 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 and just getting larger. Here, because of the movement of some of the atoms uh, molecularly across the support surface, you can wind up with smaller crystallites, as you see here, and even smaller ones here, before the smaller ones get lost the preference of the larger ones, and they finally wind up here. But you should see, at various times, smaller crystallites, as well as larger ones. So we were very interested to see what this mechanism was, because we thought it was important in how we might help ameliorate the problem. Okay, so again, we used that special TEM reactor with the inert transfer facility to try to look at this, and this is just absolutely gorgeous work that Chris did here. So I'll show you, this is the direct observation of the particle growth by TEM. So here's some pictures at the start of the run, and here you can see three different cobalt crystallites. And now, she ran fischer tropes ex situ of the TEM, but then again, was able to move it back in, and here you can see two of these cobalt particles coming together, and here's a blow up of that and you can see them forming like this. So when I saw that, I said, boy, that reminds me of my high school biology class. If you remember when the, the lovesick amoeba would come together and mate, right, it's the same thing. So here we're doing biochemistry. <laughs> then we get up to 48 days, and now actually the third cobalt product has come in and joined in the fray. Now, this part they didn't teach us about in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, so that, that, that's a direct evidence, and here's another view. This, this is so amazing to look at some of these pictures. I just love to show them. So here's starter run. Here's some particles that are fairly close together. Now they started to mate, and the blow up of that. And then finally here, now they're fully together, and it's become essentially one particle. So we see this over and over again. And no matter how hard and how much Chris looked, and trust me, she looked at as many particles as a McDonald's made hamburgers. 
see, we never have seen the smaller ones in the distribution with the larger ones. So we have not ourselves in our work, work seen the evidence of the Oswald ripening mechanism at all. Okay, so so far what I've said is that you know everything seems to be consistent with the hypothesizing mechanism that during FT synthesis cobalt goes to an oxide or hydroxide, again implicated from the water. They can they wet the support better, and you can see in the less light how they sort of touch and come together and coalesce. And that's consistent with everything we've seen, including larger particles near the reactor outlet. Now, so one, I'm getting near the end. So one um, last thing that I showed you a little bit about at the beginning, this was the same picture I showed you at the beginning with the TGA. This was this curious effect that at the end of the run, we had seen the larger tail, and that was the larger particles, which we confirmed by TM. But then we had this little uh, effect going on, the blue one, moving back towards the front one. So that was interesting because we said, well, maybe that's a way, if you do have the growth, of reversing it. Because you don't want to throw your catalyst away unless you actually have to. So if you can reverse the growth, it would be a very nice thing to do. So we thought maybe this was a way of doing it. So in order to try to understand whether there was anything to this, um, again, Chris did some really nice work with trying to look at the actual mechanism of the oxidation of the small cobalt crystallites. And you can see a little bit of here. So this is the reduced one, and the arrows are pointing to some of the cobalt metal particles. Um, and here, now it's oxidized. If you look very closely, you see something that looks like, now we're back into Dunkin' Donuts. So here's this little donut toroidal shapes that we call the hollow domes. So when these metal particles oxidize, the, again, the metal is moving from the center towards the outside. Actually, there's a little hole in the center of the particle. Remember, we use that effect in the TGA to look at the tails to see the size. But we're also seeing why that happened in, in these pictures over here. So now you have these little donuts. It's oxidized. You go back, and let's look at now what happened. So this is just another picture of, of some other particles. Here's, again, the reduced and then oxidized. So you can see some of the domes here. And then you go ahead and you reduce the domes. Because they're so um, stressed in terms of, of the way they're formed and whatever, they basically, when you reduce them, they just crack. And they form small cobalt crystallites. But what do we have? We're back to our graveyards. And we're back to the, this pattern, the gunshot uh, pattern. So you can get smaller crystallites by going through the reduction, oxidation, and re-reducing it. But as I mentioned previously, this is not the morphology you want to have. So if you take this and put it back in and run it again, it will deactivate much faster than the fresh catalyst, which had a much more homogeneous distribution. So that was not the optimum way of redispersing the catalyst. Later on, there was a group at ExxonMobil that found a way of doing that. I'm not going to get into that now. I'm going to go to my conclusion. So what I hope I've shown you is the fact that we indicated here three intrinsic, intrinsic meaning in the absence of any heteroatom poisons, three intrinsic deactivation mechanisms are present, the reversible one, which is the surface oxidation, and that leading to two irreversible ones, the mixed metal oxide formation and the particle growth by coalescence. And we use thermal and microscopic tools that were very valuable in understanding this phenomenon. There's been other work involving XFs and XPS and whatever that's helped also understand this, which I didn't show today. And the Exxon Mobil catalyst and process were designed to minimize and mitigate these deactivation routes so that in the actual process, the AGC-21 process that we have, this is a very uh, robust process based on what we learned in this type of work. So finally, let me thank some of the people. I, I need to give an unbelievable thanks to my co-authors, Chris, who did all this incredible TEM work, Gabor, with whom I worked very closely in this. He ran most of the kinetic units as well as was involved in all these characterization studies, and Joe, who works has worked with me for a long time in the lab, did a lot of the actual measurements. A bunch of people, and I'm not sure I got them all, but I want to acknowledge that uh, there was large teams involved with this at various times. This was all done in the Heritage Exxon Company before we had the merger, so you don't see any of the, uh, the after we had the merger in the phase three, which I didn't talk about, then we worked together with the uh, in the combined company to do the next step, which I haven't talked about today. So I want to thank all of those people for the help. We had some help from some academic consultants. Actually, Enrique worked in the first phase, part A, in the 1980s when he was at Exxon and, and kind of led uh, that effort in the first part of understanding things. And he came back and helped us with consulting 
in understanding what it is, and Abaye helped us with some of the microscopy stuff. And finally, my thanks to uh, ExxonMobil for letting me work on stuff that's so intriguing and letting me talk about at least a good part of it today. And thanks for your attention. <laughs> We have plenty of time for questions. If you could uh, use the, the mic right here to stand up to identify yourself and uh, ask your question. Stu, Alex Bell from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, you didn't say anything about the support composition. So I'm going to guess that it's either alumina or zirconia or something like that. But could you say something about the interplay between the cobalt oxide that forms and the support? And what can you do to engineer the the properties of that support so these particles don't move and don't center. Yeah, so that, that's a great question and that's what we spent a lot of time trying to understand. So we've looked at many different supports, all different kinds of metal oxides and other things. And obviously what you're playing with is the interaction between your particular precursor and the support and how you do that and how you vary that interaction is very critical in in, in doing it. And the main thing you want to go, now there's different, I'm not going to say there's not differences between support A, B, C, and D. There are, but those differences often involve just these interaction strains. That kind of the underlying thing that sets up the catalyst. Once the catalyst is set up, that nanoscale homogeneity with the right particle size of the cobalt is the critical thing. So you, the, the trick, not the trick, but the, the part of the study, which of course goes largely unsaid here, is how you work that issue of the interactions with the particular supports in order to get something with a good nanoscale homogeneity, good hydrothermal stability, and all the other properties that you want and need. So that part you'd have to come and work for the three decades like I did in order to see what those details <laughs> Or you can license the process. <laughs> This is Simpson Chair from Enrol. Can you comment on why the water affects after I guess we say it affects the oxidation and why would that uh, facilitate coalescence between the particles? Why does the water affect the coalescence? Because it, it all goes back to the oxidation. As you start to oxidize the particles, they interact more strongly with the support. The oxide and the hydroxides always interact more strongly with the support. They spread out more easily. They get, so if they're already reasonably close to each other, when they spread out, the diameters actually increase. And they start to touch each other. Once they touch, they can go through the coalescence. That's why this coalescence was such a, an important thing to understand. Because it talked back or fed back to the idea that we have to learn how to make these cobalt particles in the right nanoscale homogeneity. That's a key thing here that you have to do. And it's not simple. That's for sure. Hi, Stu. Charlie Wilson. Um, can you say anything about the selectivity changes for the different modes of deactivation of the catalyst? So, the cocaine versus conglomeration versus mixed metal oxide formation. Can you see selectivity changes specifically associated with different modes? I don't know that I can separate it totally. I mean, generally, um, you know, we, we studied that a lot in the first part in the, in, the, in the 1980s, and we've actually seen cases where when the particles grow, you can get it improved. Selectivity. It has a lot to do with the site time, then with the with the metal site density in the particles. And if you go back and look at some of that data, there is this, this parameter called chi that we calculated, which was related to that effect. So that plays out here. It's a lot more complicated in these systems, but it can go either way. You know, the way nature is, it usually gets worse. But <laughs> <laughs> it can, and we we published some data showing that sometimes it can improve. Again, it depends on the. It, it depends on this. It, particularly, you can get that effect when you work with larger particles when you're working in fixed bed reactors. With these, you're not not so much because you're not sort of over transport limited on the smaller particles that that, that, that are used if you go into smaller reactors. Great, you can stand up and use this, or you can shout. I don't have trouble though. But uh, <laughs> the question is on oxides that can be partially reduced on their surface, such as induced by spillover or other mechanisms, are these the ones that might lead to, as an intermediate, the formation of the mixed metal oxides and or reversibility or irreversibility between just oxidation or mixed metal I, oxide? I don't, that's a good question, Kurt. I don't think that's a necessary uh, 
requirement, for example, and it's been published in, in papers by a few people, actually Gabor, my co-author has published one, and I think uh, Calvin, the column is published. Silicon is very, can be very, uh, because of the hydrothermal environment here, silica can have a, a very high transport and often wind up forming a, a, a irreducible mixed metal oxide if it's subjected to the right hydrothermal condition. So it's not necessarily, you don't have to have, and that's not a reducible oxide. Well, so, except for my spillover, that's the reason I mentioned that, because you can reduce the surface, it can actually become active as a catalyst in its own right due to spillover. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I think I, my, my bottom line conclusion, I think is all I can probably say, is that I think you can make the mixed metal oxides with any of the supports. Some are a little more prone to it. Aluminum is well known to have vacancies where you can get cobalt to interact with cobalt aluminates. Silica can do it, other ones can as well. So that's that's another area that needs to be worked to really make something extremely robust. One, two, and then three. If you would just stand up and use the, the mic. Okay. I'll get you. You'll be next. I didn't talk enough. No, you can. Any, any promoters which can affect the uh, crystal growth of the cobalt, other metals or something. Either way. Most of what we've seen in terms of the role of the promoters has been to help in the reducibility of the cobalt. So if in, to the extent that you don't have your catalyst fully reduced, you can have additional problems in growth. But I think that's probably the, the main impact of it. Not, it, it. Just putting a promoter in there does not stop it from happening. Last two questions right here, and then your question. Uh, could, you, could you give us a comment on the impact of the reactor configuration on the uh, rate of deactivation, say fixed bed versus slattery? Yeah, so it's all a function of water. So in a fixed bed, you have problems at the back end where your conversion is high. In a fully mixed reactor where the, the water concentration is the same, it depends what, if you're at high conversion, you can have a problem everywhere. <laughs> so that's, you know, it's, it's all, it's all related it's to water. Right. Water is good to drink, it's not good to make in these <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next time I'll bubble. This is the last question. Tommy, Tommy asked me to answer this. Um, just what, you talked a lot about reduction in terms of trying to help get the couple of dispersion back, but you didn't talk about redispersion with, with carbon dioxide or some other agent to help redisperse. You also talked about the graveyards and, and other kinds of deactivation. I'm wondering right. if you had an opportunity to look at how to fully redisperse the cobalt. Yes, that, like I said, that issue was worked in the Heritage Exxon company. Michelle Dodge, who's maybe in here or not, had a lot to do with that, and, and the group that he worked with. That problem was overcome, yeah. OK? That, and yes. you can read some of the company reports. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's give, let's give Stu a hand.